how do we play to the strengths of the individual? Not just with epilepsy, but with any individual. You know, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Right. I'm better visually than I am verbally. Right. It's just, I mean, everybody has that, you know. So um, it's really important to help you, and not only help employment, but to help the person understand how can I maximize what I do. You know, I have issues with memory. Okay, let's think of some strategies to actually help with memory, to help you out so that you don't have to rely on that poor memory to get you through the day, get you through your job. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Should the evaluation be done by the same person or... It doesn't necessarily need to be done by the same person. It should be done with the same tests in mind, right? So, um, and those tests will change as you get older, right? So, I would, yes. So I would say bring that report. If you have old reports, always bring your old reports. Because that, as a neuropsychologist, that really helps me because then I can see what was done and I can try to mimic what was done before, and then I can directly compare how your memory looked here to how. It looks now, and then I can see: is there any kind of decline, or is there anything else that's playing a role that would be um, impacting how you're going about your day? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other like specific questions? Yes. Yes, yeah. Well, I think it's really important to recognize, um, especially in childhood epilepsy, the role of development as well. So some parents will bring their teenagers in and they say, oh my gosh, they're like totally going off on me. And, well, and I'm, partly I say, they're 14. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have some normal 14-year-old behavior going on there, you know. Um, not all behavior is desirable, but, um, you know, I think it's... Uh, important to recognize that if symptoms are to the point where they're causing impairment, and this isn't true in adults as well, to the point where they're interfering with school, or they're interfering to the, a significant degree at home, or they're interfering with your job, and things like that, that's the point at which to say, huh, I wonder if something else is going on here, right? Because all, all people, all individuals feel sad and anxious and things like that at times, but if it's starting to get the way, if, if for instance the kid's starting to avoid school, for instance, or they're having such, um, you know, excessive tantruming at home or something like that, that it's causing a lot of disruption in the family or something like that, that may be a time to bring them in to have an assessment done just to see what's going on, to see if it's truly um, kind of over and above what would be expected for the situation. And at that point, hopefully the person you're seeing, a psychologist, hopefully, will be able to help you determine, okay, here's what we need to do at this point, right? When we treat little kids for things like depression and anxiety and things like that, until about the age of eight or nine, most of the treatment is done with the parents, right? Um, you can send a six-year-old to therapy, but they don't, you know, there's not a whole lot of insight-oriented stuff going on at that point, just because developmentally they can't do that, any six-year-old. Um, but what we can do is help the parents to help um, kind of structure the environment in a way that would cause the individual to become less anxious or cause them to improve mood, um, cause them to have better attention, better regulation skills, that kind of thing. And that's kind of what we do, again, up until about the age of eight or nine. Um, around about the age of eight or nine, kids cognitively...